Okay, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> let's pick off, pick up where we left off last time. I'll close this hazard. Uh, <clears throat> so I tried to argue that we were going to shift from these sort of global methods, which I think are um, exactly the right thing to do in moderate dimensions, to something maybe the, the only way to really scale to really high dimensions is to give up on saying something for all possible x in super high dimensions and restrict your attention to, in the extreme, a very narrow band, a single trajectory in the high dimensional system last time. Okay, Now, Solving only a single trajectory in the high dimensional system is good for making videos uh, on the computer. It's not good for executing anything on a real robot because the real world's going to take you a little bit off that trajectory and if you haven't thought about that, then you're dead in the water. So today we're going to try to extend that idea to looking at sort of a band of, of the system. You know, so we'd like to look in the vicinity of that trajectory and see if we can take some of our um, some of the tools we've already in, worked on and make them sort of relevant in the vicinity of a trajectory in the high dimensional space. Okay, so <clears throat> how are we going to do that? And the, the, the key idea here is that, uh, the first key idea, I guess, is that the same way we were able to do in high dimensions stabilization of a fixed point via linearization, the natural thing you'd ask is, can we linearize around a non-fixed point along a trajectory uh, and use linear tools to say something at least locally about the system's performance around a trajectory, okay? So, Um, so it's really easy to write a few equations here and have everything just pop out and I think nobody will really understand it if, if I do it that way. So I'm going to try to, I've tried to find ways to do pictures. It's hard to draw time varying pictures, but let me, I'm going to try to draw some pictures uh, to see if we get there uh, graphically first, right? So the one I think that was the most visual so far was when we were talking about linearizing the fixed point of the pendulum, right? Looks like they have two colors here today. So if I plotted the phase portrait of the pendulum, which the nonlinear phase portrait looked like this, right? <coughs> And we, if we linearized around the fixed point, then we got eigenvectors that looked like this with eigenvalues that described what the system did along those vectors and that they even gave an eigenbasis so that the eigen analysis tells us how to draw the entire vector field and it looked really good in the vicinity of the fixed point and uh, not so good farther from the fixed point. I'm just getting chalky enough. Okay, so <clears throat> last time we we worked on trajectory optimization to find single solutions, some single path that could, for instance, go like this and find a solution across the nonlinear dynamics from the uh, uh, the downward fixed point to the upward fixed point. So that was a single path that landed all the way in the orbit. And maybe it didn't go quite that high, but you, but you get my, my point. Um, <clears throat> so the question we have to ask ourselves is, if we were to linearize along somewhere else on the trajectory, how well is that, is that gonna have the same sort of interpretation that we had here, right? So let's say I picked, and I did pick um, you know, something like, uh, you know, theta zero is negative three pi over four, and theta dot, if it's inside the homoclinic orbit, it's, it's one is safely inside the homoclinic orbit. And I don't exactly know what the trajectory it's solved for is, but let's just say that u is one. I'm guessing it's positive if it's shoving us this way. 
Okay, so let's say, what if we were to try to linearize around that point instead? What does that look like? Okay. And the equations um, that we had, theta dot was, it was ML squared U minus B theta dot minus MGL sine theta. And I'm going to set M equals L equals 1. I'll set B equal to 0 and G equal to 10 to get um, just theta dot U minus 10 sine theta. <clears throat> now we can linearize that around any, or we can take a, a Taylor expansion of that around any point. And last time we picked the we picked this point, but let's just write it out slightly more generally here. So the, the Taylor expansion of this is around any nominal point, which is an operating point in both x and u, of course, plus partial f partial x, x minus x zero plus partial f partial u, u minus z, u zero, and these are evaluated at those operating points. Right, those gradients. Okay, so um, at the fixed point, the first good thing that happened was this term was zero, right? Because it was a fixed point, so theta dot, or sorry, x dot at the fixed point is zero. It's a stationary point, that's the sort of definition. So that's nice. And then these terms turned out to come out to be really easy. It was 0 and 10, 0, 1, 10, 0. Anyways, I'm going to do the more general version in a second. Pretty easy. And it was the eigenvectors of this matrix that we plotted to get, the, to get this response. Eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this matrix here. <clears throat> okay, but if I pick some other values, uh, you know, some other x and u, I might not get so lucky. So, um, in general, this thing looks like, of course, that. It's going to be theta dot 0, u0 minus 10 sine theta 0. And that's not going to be 0 at some arbitrary point here. Because the vector field is, in fa it's in fact plotting that vector right there. So I know what that looks like. <clears throat> and then what does partial f, partial x look like? It's still 0, 1, because this term just only depends on theta dot. Still, because b is 0, I don't have any dependence on theta dot over here. This one's still 0. And this one's only a little bit harder, 10 cosine evaluated at that nominal angle. Partial f partial u is still just 0 and 1. Okay, so first thing to notice here is that my, my linearization here, it actually looks pretty similar. The cosine theta, you know, when, when theta zero is equal to pi, remember this is the theta zero equals pi, theta dot zero equals zero, u zero equals zero. <coughs> which makes that a positive 10. And that's what gave us this eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And in general, the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this are going to be, um, you know, plus or minus negative 10 cosine of wherever you linearize around. It's just simple linear algebra and the eigenvectors are going to be negative 10 cosine theta. Okay, so when theta naught was pi, we got this 
eigenvectors and eigenvalues. That's just the one square root of 10 line. This is the one, negative one square root of 10 line. And as I change theta, so I'm gonna move this way. It turns out because b is, is zero, it doesn't affect anything when I go up and down, which is a little concerning, right? Even if I, if I move that up and down, that's a little concerning. Okay, but if I start moving it this way, what happens is that this line, this, this number is gonna get smaller, so that line is gonna get flatter and flatter and flatter. So the, these are gonna just go as they go this way, okay? Until they get to, to here, and then they go imaginary. Sorry, somewhere over here, wherever, wherever cosine theta goes under zero, right? They're gonna go imaginary, and certainly at zero, they're imaginary. That's what you'd want. The imaginary response is the oscillations that we'd expect to see of the passive pendulum. I can't draw them without drawing, going to the imaginary uh, axis, but that is correct. When it's back here again, it'll represent the oscillations of the undamped pendulum. Okay, but somehow it's missing, it's not capturing this more global features the way that this was like magically good, right? Here it's magically good again, but you know, up here it doesn't seem right. There is this extra term, right? So it is, so as I shift up there, I do get this whole thing being, it's this matrix, plus that whole thing is being shoved down by a constant here. So it actually is not so bad, maybe, if I took this x up here and I, and I added on top of it a huge vector pushing down, then maybe it's gonna get a little bit more of a representative picture. Okay, but I guess my point is this breaks. This breaks down. Um, it, it doesn't feel like a great representation across the, across the phase portrait of the pendulum at least not in this coordinate system, okay? So what we need to do is think about a slightly different coordinate system, <clears throat> and then everything's gonna snap back into place, okay? So what's the right coordinate system? It's only slightly different. So I have that trajectory, x0, u0, let's say, for example, you come up with it any way you want, but from trajectory optimization. And my only requirement for it is that it's consistent. with the dynamics. So I'd like the time derivative of this trajectory to be consistent. Yeah? Is that old way of doing linearization, which we did before, will that always work around fixed points? And it's just that it won't always work around non-fixed points? Correct, for smooth systems. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, unfortunately, me being a humanoid um, that can make and break contact with the ground right at the place I'd like to be fixed, I have a fixed point, that actually violates that assumption. So there are places that we care about for which that does, where it's not smooth, but for smooth systems, quad rotors, you name it, it's good. <clears throat> okay, so um, as long as I have sort of a feasible trajectory, then the way to think about the slightly different coordinate system to think about here is now, it's a kind of a weird object, but my, my coordinate system I care about is gonna be x minus this moving trajectory, okay? <clears throat> so my coordinate system is moving on, in time on a clock, okay? So, so if, I, if, if my 
controller, for whatever reason, gets the system to stay still, then my, I'm still moving in this coordinate system. The coordinate system is moving away from me. The origin of the coordinate system is just moving along that trajectory. It's on, it's on a track. It's on a, you know, on a reel. It's just going to go forward whether I do anything or not. Okay. And similarly, I'll put myself on this other moving coordinate system here. And the advantage there, as you can see, is now that x dot being f of x zero is that this term is x dot zero. So it drops out the way we wanted in the moving coordinate system. It's just the partial f partial x, x bar plus partial f partial u, u bar. Okay, so it's now linear in this moving coordinate system. That's good. This was an affine term that was not linear. It didn't hold, superposition doesn't hold for this, but it does for this, okay? I'm going to call this A carefully because it's a little bit more than A, right? This has got to be evaluated at x equals x0 t, u equals 0, 0 of t. So the values hiding inside this gradient in this moving coordinate system are actually also on a clock. They're time varying. Okay? And this one I'm going to call ET. And the system that I come out with is this X bar equals which is the time varying linearization. And it's meaningful locally for smooth systems along any feasible consistent trajectory of the system. But is it of any good, right? And so it's kind of a weird thing, right? It's, um, I'm gonna now by putting myself in that coordinate system, I'm going to say the problem I'd like to solve is to stabilize a time varying linear system. So it's like I have a linear system here with the eigenvalues that, let's say, start like this and then they go up and they go down and they're going to do it on some schedule, right? And they might go imaginary, right? And I know a priori what that schedule is. I have, I can compute this, but can I come up with a controller that will play the game just right, even though my system is varying over time, to solve that problem? Is that dramatically harder than the linear solutions we were already doing? And it actually really surprised me the first time I, I learned it, and maybe if you haven't seen it, it'll su surprise you too, but because this is a very powerful general representation, right? You can put a lot of systems into this form. I can take any, uh, through, through any of these nonlinear systems, I get this, right? Um, but we can still do control design on this. This is in the scope of what we can do with linear control. Linear time varying control is almost as good as, as linear control. You have to be a little bit more careful about your statements and everything, but a lot of our tricks work. And in particular, LQR works. A small variation of LQR works, okay? <clears throat> So in this coordinate system, because I've chosen this error coordinate, right, it is the case that if, if I can drive x bar to zero, then that implies that um, x is going to go to x zero of t. And if I can stabilize the system at zero in this moving coordinate system, that means I've stabilized the trajectory. Yeah. Okay, so we've got a great 
new class of systems. The question is just how do you, how do you stabilize that? It turns out that, uh, like I said, we could still do LQR. So, let's see what it looks like. All right. <clears throat> um, my objective is basically the same. I'm going to minimize my whole U bar trajectory over some quadratic cost. I'm going to leave that alone for a second. Now there's some discussion to be had about this, the, the domain of the integration over time. We've always done it infinite horizon so far. This, so far we've only defined, if we're coming, we've got a trajectory coming out of trajectory optimization that's only good for a finite amount of time. Okay, but in the example we started with here of, of the pendulum swinging to the top, I could actually think of the trajectory I'm trying to stabilize as being infinite. It starts here at time zero, it goes here, and since it's gonna stay there for all time afterwards, I could think of having a well-defined x and u that goes infinitely far into the future, okay? So let me start with the maybe beautiful case um, of going to infinity, and we're going to think about what that means. <clears throat> we, can also, we can also start with, maybe I should even start with this one. I'll, I'm going to connect the two, but... All right, so um, just like last time, the magic here is understanding, having a guess for what the, the Hamilton-Jacobi solution is going to look like. So j of x bar of t, now it's going to be a time varying cost to go. The magic formula here is choosing still a quadratic form, but now it's a time varying quadratic form. Once you do that, if you put in your uh, Bellman equation, we have to worry about the time derivative too. But we can do that, right? This is just the, the one we're familiar with, and this is something that looks like x bar transpose s dot x bar. This is just exactly like we had before. <clears throat> and what magically comes out is I can first, if this is a quadratic cost, right, with all the standard assumptions, Minimizing u, this is still that same quadratic form, and it's linear in u here, quadratic in u here, and I get my u bar is bt partial j partial x, and derivations in the notes, but it works out to be almost the same as what we had before. As you'd expect, the you know, this contributed nothing to you. This was the same thing we had before with just a bunch of t's sprinkled in, but, but the solution can be a, a time-dependent solution here too. Okay? So now u bar is somehow a time varying. The standard way to write that would be it's a time varying linear controller. The cost to go is this funny thing that depends on time. And this equation actually only de defines its dynamics over time. It gives us a solution if you plop in the, the, optimal, cost to, uh, the optimal policy here. It gives us a solution of what s dot has to be in order to be consistent. 
that makes sense? I mean, you can see algebraically the things that are going to pop up here are we're going to have terms like this, terms like this, and we're going to have s dot sitting in here. That whole thing has to equal zero. So what I get out is a differential equation that governs the rules of s. Okay, and it's this, the famous Riccati differential equation. which is almost identical to what you've seen before, but with T's sprinkled everywhere. If you so chose, you could have had Q and R be time varying too. That wouldn't have complicated anything. Okay, so to be consistent, remember how our interpretation of this was Go downhill as fast as possible. That's the optimal action. And that the time, to, the rate that I go downhill, given the optimal strategy, has to be the gradient of my cost to go function. In order for that all to be consistent, the matrix S has to satisfy this matrix differential equation. It's interesting, and the reason I, you might wonder why I put a negative sign on the front here. Why didn't I put the negative over there? Because this, like the dynamic programming idea, it's the boundary solution, the boundary value we have for this is actually at the final time. So the way we're going to solve this is actually by pinning it down at the final time and then integrating it backwards. The way you integrate backwards is you can think of it as integrating forwards the negative of the original equation. Okay? So... The question is just, what is the cost to go at the final time? And that's where it gets more tricky what I've picked for TF or infinite. If I say it's infinity, then I could just pick this to be Q, or I can pick it to be almost anything, actually. <clears throat> but a natural choice Maybe the simplest thing to say would be if I put on a final cost So I'll say I'm going to I'm going to integrate this cost to go for tf seconds and then I'm going to wherever I got to I'm going to give a one time final cost x transpose tf in that case, the final condition is just Q, F. Let me put a subscript on there just, okay. There's another variant of it. Think about this, if, I, if my controller, if my, my goal actually is to stabilize this trajectory for the first TF seconds, and then turn on the infinite time LQR once I'm close to the fixed point, then what do you think this is going to play out to be? You can think of that as being from TF to T infinity. I've got my X transpose Qx, but with my, now with x dot equals a x plus bu time invariant, that total cost means that qf is just going to be the s that I get from LQR. I, I don't know if I said that well enough. If you want this to represent the rest of time, once life is good and my system can be thought of as a time invariant linear system, then I already know what the cost to go is. It does take this form, but it's the cost to go from LQR. So solve LQR once, get S, use that as your final cost in this formulation, your initial condition for S, the, the differential equation, 
and then solve this differential equation backwards in time. So let me stop and take any questions there. I, that was the algebra heavy part. But I, but I want, yeah. Did you have a question? Maybe. So how come it's like stationary after TF? The A is not a function time anymore? Ah, this is, I'm saying in the special case of landing at a fixed point. If I think of my trajectory as actually ending at a fixed point and then x0 is constant for the rest of time, then the same strategy basically has a being fixed for the rest of time. What's that? You landed basically. You're home. <laughs> Good. If you think about how to integrate this, this is just a differential equation. You can call that, you can call your favorite numerical integration routines on that. Solve it backwards. It turns out when you get, when you get to, um, there's, there's people that sort of make a business, make a career out of understanding this equation. Uh, you, can, you can integrate this better than the standard numerical differential equations. For instance, if a small numerical error were to make S ever go less than positive definite, then you've, you've achieved nonsense, right? That's, that doesn't make sense. So there are like square root methods to solve this where you, you solve the square root of this to make sure it stays positive always. And there's all, all kinds of numerical recipes for this kind of thing too. It's a famous equation. This is the um, differential Riccati equation. There's an equivalent in discrete time. Continuous time is sort of beautiful. Okay, so um, the first message is that if we cho choose this moving coordinate system, moving along the trajectory, then surprisingly, I think, linear control still works. Um, it, it sort of, it works pretty well. There are some caveats, right? Yeah. Is, is Q at the end the differential Riccati equation? This is the final condition? Yeah. So I'm going to integrate this back. You think of normally you integrate forward. My initial conditions are x0, and then I, I integrate f of x forward. This is x, s is at team final is qf, and this is this q, not qf is my governing my equations going backwards. So let's say I'm stabilizing this trajectory. This takes me to my fixed point, okay? And now let's say I'm back at this familiar point. Or, or let's say that time is such that x0 of t, u0 of t has me here. Then it's in the short term, it's putting up a coordinate system which is mapping the dynamics here in a pretty satisfying way if you were to make those plots, okay? <clears throat> the limitation though is that it's on a clock. My coordinate system is moving forward whether I like it or not. So it, when I'm trying to stabilize this, if I find myself here, what's it gonna do? It's trying to drive, you'd kind of like it to drive the distance between my current state and the normal nominal trajectory to zero. That's not what we're doing. We're driving the difference between this, the current state and whatever the clock says I should be at to zero. So it's gonna to try to pull itself up to there, okay? Which is maybe not so bad. Doesn't, doesn't sound so bad. It's a little bit more annoying if I was found myself here Right? It might actually, uh, you know, try to go back in order to go up, which feels kind of wrong. Um, but that's what we got. That's what linear control is going to give us for now. We're going. There is actually a slightly more satisfying solution that we'll talk about when we get into walking robots because it manifests itself more nice, nicely there. The objective is always the cost I'm trying to minimize is the length of that vector effectively in the moving coordinate system. 
So as it starts, it's going to you know do what it can to minimize that cost. Probably in this position, it would be starting to move like you can't go this way in uh, you know theta dot is positive, so it's definitely going. Its main component is this way. It's going to start going like this. This is going to catch up a little bit, and it'll sort of fight itself into trying to drive that to zero to the extent that the linearization tells me how to do that. Right? And it's still a linearization in the sense that I'd expect it to be a valid description of a vector field in the vicinity of that point, and the farther I get away, the less well it'll capture it. Right? One of the beautiful things about this is that when I was here, driving myself towards that fixed point keeps me with my linearization being good. For the same reason here, it's you typically, you actually, even if you don't care about following the trajectory precisely, it pays to, to have some cost on being away from the trajectory just to stay in the place where the linearization is valid, right? Okay, so LQR works pretty well, and that's, that's the first part of the story. But what if I'm now in the vicinity of some constraints? Or let's say I have input limits. The message I hope you got last time was that for unconstrained linear we did LQR. Once you had some had some constraints, linear constraints, that I went to a linear model predictive control. That's the natural sort of hierarchy. So I don't have a, I mean LQR is not quite closed form, but it's almost closed form. You have to still call a numerical recipe to solve for S, but that numerical recipe is, it's almost as good as having a closed form solution. Now I have to solve an optimization problem. So, just to keep it simple, I'll do the discrete time version of it again. But these can all be in the error coordinates. Again, we could do the shooting method, where we're, we're solving from initial conditions um, x0 forward. Or we can do the, the direct transcription method, where we add extra decision variables for x and solve a slightly bigger QP, but that's more sparse. In both cases, though, and for the same reason, it's not a sort of, it's not an accident that this happens. But adding AFT here, and the math still worked, and adding a time varying A here now changes the values I place in my, you know, my constraint matrices, but everything we said before still works. Right? There's no dependence on X in there. These are still linear constraints. still a quadratic program. So I think, I, I, I want you to think in your head that the unconstrained solution locally is LQR. And once I have constraints, like input saturations or state constraints, the next thing in the hierarchy is this linear model predictive control. LQR allows me to say something, um, you know, nice for LQR. In the case I have an infinite trajectory, okay, for 
smooth systems, the time varying LQR, I'll even, uh, sometimes I call it TV LQR to be explicit, time varying LQR, it locally stabilizes that trajectory in the space. I only feel comfortable using the word stabilize if I'm talking about infinite horizon. So it, so it makes sense when, time, when, when this thing goes to a fixed point, so I do have an infinite description. You have to use different language if you're talking about a finite trajectory. But in the example we gave there, it locally stabilizes that. So if I'm in the vicinity of this, of this nominal trajectory, it will stabilize that. For the unconstrained system. And similarly, linear model predictive control will also lo locally stabilize the system. With strong and gives you some strong guarantees. Okay. By virtue of this being an optimization that I can expect to solve the global optimality, it's convex, I can expect to solve it quickly. But there are some details, okay? We have to be careful to talk about the stability of an MPC controller for a couple reasons. Well, first, you know, Ned gave a nice example the other day. He said that he was working at this at a company and uh, that the ability, they were solving QPs online, but the timing variation that they could get by solving QPs to optimality could be worse, actually, than, uh, than other sources of potential error. So they actually did not solve the QPs to optimality. They would solve the Q, they would take a few iterations of the algorithm, but a fixed number of iterations on the algorithm, right? And make an update at a, at a fixed time, no matter what. And so, so the analysis of stability there gets more complicated, that, and that's a real thing. People do that in industry all the time. The analysis of the stability there gets more complicated. How can you prove that your system will build, still be stabilized if the QP is not being solved to optimality on every step? And there's nice work to be had there, okay? Even if you do solve the QP to every step, uh, on every step, you can still screw up and, or you, you have to be a little careful to get this total stability property. Um, <clears throat> and so let me just make sure you're aware of that, those subtleties, okay? And the basic problem is that you can't solve an infinite QP for time going to infinity. You're always solving some truncated version of the problem you'd really like to solve. You always have to do, do some finite horizon approximation of it. And if you do that right, you can still guarantee stability. If you do that wrong, you can, um, actually even the, the, the first thing you type in, you might not get it right, okay? So um, a standard way to do this is to think of it as a receding horizon, horizon control. T or N, whichever one word. Let's do it in N just to be consistent here. Okay. So at time zero, I'm going to solve an optimization problem, but I have only a finite amount of computational resources to do some look ahead. Okay. So I'll optimize some trajectory that minimizes an LQR cost, for instance, 
that goes here, but there's no reason that the LQR solution uh, that I would ask for is it's just going to, you know, it'll get close, but it might not be done in, in whatever computational limit I have, right? This is sort of my... Okay, at the, at the very next time step, right, we're gonna, the, the way we do the model predictive control, remember, was that I'm gonna solve a trajectory optimization at time zero, I'm gonna execute the first action, figure out where I went, and then solve another optimization problem. Okay, at a second horizon. So this first one is my um, MPC at um, time zero. And this blue one is the MPC problem I'm trying to solve at time one. So to talk about stability and convergence of my MPC controller, the bag of, of tools gets a little bit different, but the intuition you have to think about here is that there's a few things, the optimization problem is basically the same. All those terms are gonna appear identically in my cost function for the two problems. All the costs that I had related to n, you know, n from one to big N minus one, or big N original. All my constraints in here are the same. But those constraints are different and these constraints are different. In particular, and the cost that I got here is different, is gone, and I'm gonna incur some new cost here. So in order to talk about the stability of this finite look ahead but receding horizon controller, the game becomes understanding how the, what's the difference between when I take this one away and add this one in. What is that, how does that optimization change over time? So what could go wrong? What do I have to guard against? The worst thing that could happen is that I add a new constraint to my optimization problem and I suddenly become infeasible. There was something I just didn't think far enough ahead. Actually, I can't achieve my objective. So my solver is just gonna come to a cold stop saying, no, there's no solution anymore, sorry. Wish you had looked ahead a little bit further, right? So you have to guard against infeasibility. And that's entirely possible. You're adding new constraints into the problem that weren't there before, right? Maybe they're similar to the constraints we added before, but they're on a new variable. That, that, that could happen if you're not careful. Okay. And the other thing we want for stability is to somehow understand how the costs change, okay? We'd like to say that the cost added at the end should be smaller than the cost that fell away at the initial conditions. It's a little bit of a different way to think about things, but are people cool with that? This idea that there's one term of my summation that disappears when I've moved forward, and there's one new term that got added. Okay. If I can say that the cost that's added is definitely gonna be smaller than the cost that was taken away, then actually the cost
of solving this problem from n equals k to k plus n, subject to the constraints. The, the result that I get from my optimization, the value, optimal value, can be a Lyapunov function. Okay. In the discrete time, what you'd like to say is that v of x k plus 1 is less than or equal to v of x k, that I'm going downhill on my Lyapunov function. Okay. If you have this property that you can guarantee when I've added that new cost on the end, I don't go infeasible and my cost is only going to be smaller, then you can actually prove stability of the, of the algorithm, the QP algorithm, with a Lyapunov argument. It's pretty cool. Okay. So how do you choose that? There's a, there's a handful of ways to like make sure that those two things are are satisfied. There's a there's a, a number of approaches that you can you can use. Um, <clears throat> the simplest one, maybe the most common one, but the, certainly the simplest one to uh, explain is if you were to formulate your original problem and ask that at the end of my window, I'd like um, I'd like to be at the goal here. If I add a constraint a final value constraint that x at the final horizon is at my goal. Why does that help me? <clears throat> if I can get to the fixed point, let's say, of, of my pendulum, right, then that's going to, then staying at that fixed point later is an easy way to argue, and you have to do the argument, but that getting there and staying there is something that's always going to be feasible. At very least, it reduces my feasibility analysis from an arbitrary set to just asking about the feasibility of a single point. Okay. Furthermore, the cost that I'm going to add is going to be zero. So that's a sort of a simple way to achieve both of these statements. It's different than the standard LQR, but it achieves the goal of giving guarantees in a receding horizon sense of the model predictive controller. Yeah? Was the initial condition used for the blue position current? Is it the current position of the robot or the current position of the robot plus the time it would take me to compute the second optimization? Good. There's multiple levels of analysis of the MPC controllers. In this one, I assumed that the model was perfect and I ended up where I expected to end up. And this is a sufficient argument then to show stability of the algorithm. You need at least that. There's an additional bit of work that if you also have expect some disturbances, um, you can still talk about robust MPC under disturbances. And then you get into the game of propagating uncertainty sets. You tend to put some uh, set approximation on what can happen and argue that all of those are going to be OK. This is the simple case where the model was correct. I didn't get any disturbances. I just want to make sure the algorithm doesn't do, I still does as well as LQR would have done. But in that first case, we are not using like feedback. We are just initializing the second optimization product from the condition where I think I will be at that time. The algorithm that I'm analyzing could be interpreted that way. I would prefer to think of it as I'm pulling the state off and it just happens to be where I hoped I was going to be. Yes, but you could say I'm just going to march ahead blind. Yeah. Okay, you can also do nonlinear MPC. I could, you know, this, this sort of, I think, this argument, this, this uh, linear model predictive control, I talked about it initially as a trajectory optimization algorithm, and now we're using it as a trajectory stabilization algorithm. Right? Because locally, I'm, I'm happy to make this time varying linear approximation, so it's sort of a natural way to stabilize even a nonlinear system in the vicinity. But that, it sort of. It tells you that there's a close connection between trajectory optimization and trajectory stabilization. 
And if you were good enough at doing the full nonlinear trajectory optimization, in the first place, you could also try to run the nonlinear trajectory optimization to stabilize your trajectory. You just won't have as, as many guarantees, right? So like, we're willing to do that on our robot arms, we're not willing to do that on our running robot. But you, you, can, you can do that, and if you do do that, then these kind of intuitions are still useful intuitions for solving, uh, for trying to get, give your nonlinear solver the best chance it can get at it being feasible on the next step, and the cost would go down. In fact, does that make sense? Yeah, that you could just do, you could just solve the nonlinear trajectory optimization every time step. The duality actually goes the other way too. You can actually use time varying LQR to do trajectory optimization of a nonlinear system. And that's a pretty popular algorithm. It's called iterative LQR, okay? The basic idea is you have an initial guess. You know, this is now for trajectory optimization. You start with an initial guess. You solve the, you stabilize this trajectory. using a slightly different cost function. If I have my initial, my initial cost was g of x u, what I'm going to use is a quadratic approximation of my nonlinear cost. Okay? So g of x u, if I make a, a second order Taylor expansion, I'll do a second order Taylor expansion, okay? And that gives me an LQR problem, which is almost exactly that, but it has some cross terms too. It's not a simple quadratic form, it's a full quadratic form. So I'm gonna minimize over u, integral or, or the, the sum, whichever one you've done, x transpose qx plus there's some extra terms there's even potentially a cross term but maybe unsurprisingly at this point all the math runs through. And the picture you should have in your head, I mean, the controller you get is no longer trying to drive me to the origin. This is a full quadratic form. So the cost function here was always a quadratic form that at any point it was the, the bull was at the origin, right? And as I was moving forward. But if I'm taking a quadratic approximation of my original cost function, it need not be driving me directly towards this origin. In fact, it could give me very different quadratic forms 
like maybe something like this. Maybe the origin's way over here. You can still try to solve that without QR. The controller that comes out is going to be linear plus some other term that's driving me this way. It's going to try to go downhill on this function. The details are all, I don't want you to get stuck in the math. I want you to think about the picture, right? So I have a quadratic form that originally I just said x transpose qx. So it was always a bowl centered at my trajectory, which is moving along my trajectory. Now if I'm, if I'm taking the quadratic approximation of an arbitrary cost function, it's still going to be a quadratic, but it, I've lost the, uh, the constraint that it has to be on my trajectory. And in fact, linear control can still try to be linearizing here and drive me towards that. Try to minimize that other quadratic cost function. That works fine. The problem is, it's going to move me away from my linearization point. So what you do is you iterate. You solve this once, you'll get a new trajectory candidate that's over here. Your linearization might be garbage. So you linearize again around this new one push towards that and do iterative LQR in order to do trajectory optimization. That makes sense? In fact, I hope it makes sense because that's very, very similar to what SNOPT is doing given the original way we wrote the problem. Remember how we said we wrote down that trajectory optimization problem? and then SNOPT is doing a local quadratic programming approximation of it, solving one iteration, and then making a new local quadratic programming approximation. Okay, SNOPT behind the scenes was doing almost this. This one turns out to be a little bit more clever than SNOPT because it understands the Riccati equation. So it's gonna use this, this magical form to make a, a, maybe a better second order update. So some people prefer this to the snopped. Just one sec. But it is limited to unconstrained optimization problems. The preference, so if I, as soon as I put in constraints, I don't have the LQR, I could, I could do iterative linear model predictive control, and that's fine, but that's very close to what snopped is doing. But some people like this and the, the convergence rate of this so much that they're willing to take any of their costs, shove, sorry, any of their constraints and just shove them into their costs as penalty and then try to do this solve. And that's some of the, some of the state of the art trajectory optimization. Is there one more term in the integral cost with the xt and SM matrix u? It, I, it, there's a, there's a, it's a scalar, so I could just double P whatever. It's captured in there. Yep. Okay, those big ideas land? Yes? Is changing our trajectory, that is fine. Say it again? Uh, the algorithm is changing the trajectory. The algorithm is changing, so this is something you would do offline to do trajectory optimization with. Okay. You would take your initial guess at the trajectory, you'd improve it by saying what would it be like to stabilize that trajectory with this weird cost function that's not centered at the trajectory with LQR. You know, and then you run that controller under the stabilization, it gives me a new trajectory. Now I'll linearize around that and repeat. This is not the reference trajectory. We are trying to optimize We're gonna change the reference trajectory with an iterative algorithm, yeah. That's what I'm, there's a duality between stabilization and optimization. If you can do trajectory optimization fast enough, you can use it to stabilize. And if you can stabilize a non-trivial trajectory, then you can actually do that over and over again to try to optimize. Okay, there's one more step that is um, super useful, but it, I think I'll just say it instead of writing it all out. But not surprisingly, our sums of squares tools are gonna work for this too. If I have a linear system here with a cost to go given by this, this is a Lyapunov candidate, which I know will be a Lyapunov function for the linear, time varying linear system. And the question is, is it, 
for what states is it still a layoff and off function for the nonlinear system? If you take that, and the, the, that's written up carefully in the notes, if you take that, then the picture you should have in your head, and now I can switch to some pictures here, is that if you want to stabilize your pendulum at the upright, you can take your, your unstable fixed point, stabilize it with LQR, use sums of squares to, to figure out what the region of attraction is of that linear controller. Now you do trajectory optimization, you get a trajectory that goes from the origin up to the top, and what you'd like to do is find a time-varying Lyapunov function that says that that LQR controller is going to work in the vicinity of that trajectory and land me inside, right, the level set that matters of that time-varying Lyapunov function is the one who's, who, whose outlet lands on the inlet of, that, of the LQR controller. You could think of this like a funnel. It's a funnel that takes initial conditions that start here and drags it along state space, dumps it out here, and there's another funnel ready to catch it, which is my LQR controller, my time invariant LQR controller. Okay? I made a funnel video. It's a funnel. Okay? So that's maybe the way to think about it. So I promised on the, in the first lecture that I would tell you some more details about um, how this thing worked. And it turns out we've got all the tools we need to do that now. So let's, let me tell you that some of the details of that, the perching work. So again, airplanes do that, birds do that. Right? They're going to deep post stall, and owls are cool. Um, so trying to put on the dynamics hat, we actually talked about the dimensional analysis of this. So how impressive is it that what birds are doing relative to a plane? Okay, so the way you have to do that is you can take a bunch of data from birds landing on a perch, a bunch of data from airplanes landing on a runway, but they're at totally different scales. Okay, so you have to normalize out mass and wing area and the, even the density of the fluid, although they're in the same fluid. Um, and then if they go from a distance, if they take some distance to stop from X, you know, from, from some initial uh, coasting velocity to V final, you know, the, four, the 747, 450 mile an hour cruise speed down to touching down is one set of data. The bird flying in at a few meters per second and then landing on a perch is another set of data. You can try to compare those if you scale out the relative dimensions, okay? And that quantity that you get when you do that comparison is basically a drag coefficient, if you know aerodynamics, but it's a distance average drag coefficient. So it's like the average drag you've gotten uh, dimensionless over the course of that trajectory. We thought that was maybe a fair way to compare birds versus planes, okay? So then we went off and tried to find some reference points. So the average drag coefficient that a 747 gets on the runway is uh, about 0.16. I guess there's a 737 max joke that I won't, I won't make. Um, you know, so there are some planes that, that are uh, designed to be super short landers. They, they land on a very short runway. Um, X-31 was a big one, it was a, a famous one. Um, it got a 0.3 when it was landing. Uh, there was a Cornell project on a perching plane that actually tried to morph its tail down so that it would still have control authority when it was landing. It got about a 0.25 in the wind tunnel. And then we went to birds, and gee, I worked so hard to try to find like some really cool bird to get some numbers on but my collaborators at Harvard study pigeons, right? And uh, they had tons of data that we couldn't ignore, but it was all about pigeons. And actually they convinced me that pigeons were some of the best birds, actually. That uh, even though like a Eurasian owl attacking a camera looks better, uh, the pigeons actually being the scavenger of the urban environment can get in and get out pretty well. Uh, so anyways, I, I ended up getting a number on a pigeon. What do you think the pigeon is? Yeah, so I forget, I forget exactly what the numbers were, but basically it would be equivalent to a 747 going from its, seven, its 450 mile an hour cruise speed to, to zero in about 30 meters. That's the, that's the scaling. 
its wings would pop off. There's structural things that, that would have to be taken into account, but um, it's pretty impressive what these birds are doing. It's like deploying a parachute at full, you know, and, and being able to not only, I mean, anybody can sort of stop. I could just run into a wall and I would stop. <laughs> but uh, to be able to land on a perch, you know, being controlled while you stop, that's impressive. So the, um, the yeah, sure. You say the picture. Oh, sorry. <laughs> ah, crap. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, we built the simplest possible. We actually built some more complicated things first, and they worked to some extent. But the, to try to get the argument across, we built the simplest possible plane that could do this. It was uh, a glider, no propeller. It had a single, it was flat plate wings by the end, a single um, actuator on the tail. That's it. The elevator was, was a single actuator. Everything else was passive. Gave it some dihedral for some passive roll stability so we could think about only its sagittal plane dynamics. And this was one of the first um, you know, motion capture systems on campus. Now they're everywhere. First thing we did was a bunch of system identification. We needed our model, right? So it turns out you can do beautiful system identification. Everybody says, okay, put it in a wind tunnel, you know, put it, but we don't want the wind tunnel data because that's all quasi-static. We wanted the, the trajectory of this plane and understanding the dynamic uh, stall kind of effects. So we just shot it into motion capture a bunch of times differentiated twice, got the accelerations, and backed out the, the lift and drag coefficients. Okay, um, so we just, I think this is a video of it. Yeah, it's a video of it shooting a bunch of times into the, yeah, um, into the wind tunnel. We had to buy a, a net to make sure we wouldn't crash it too much. And the lift and drag coefficients that came out were beautiful, just way beyond my expectations. Um, it's kind of funny, if, you, if you've looked at it, lift and drag plots before, they don't normally go to 120 degrees angle of attack. <laughs> like they're normally from zero to like you know 16 or something like that, right? So this is kind of ridiculous that it's already going backwards here, um, and that's flat plate theory, which is super simple and described the data incredibly well. Uh, the angle of attack on the on the, the drag coefficient looks messy, but actually that's not noise. If you looked at it over time, you'd see oscillations, and that was the vortex shedding. So we could see a, a periodic shedding in the drag coefficient that was the vortices pulling off the back that we could actually um, predict from the data, and then we built a wind tunnel and measured and again, confirmed our prediction. So the 6832 model of this <laughs> is, boils down to a flat plate with a, just a few state variables and a single actuator. It's an under-actuated system, okay. And, uh, you know, when it's all said and done, it's entering motion capture. We built a cannon, or basically a crossbow to, to launch it off the launcher. It enters at six meters per second. The perch is less than three and a half meters away. The entire trajectory is a second. We argued that you couldn't do that without separation on the wings. You can't stop that fast in the standard attached flow regime. Um, and we did it a bunch of times. We uh, started working on, on claws that would perch. <clears throat> and we built a wind tunnel to sort of do the flow visualization to make sure we understood what, what the heck we were talking about. That video, like, in the build time, how fast is that? Uh, 0.8 seconds. Yeah. Delay in motion capture was a major issue back then. Because it was motion capture was getting fast. It was getting up to like 50 or 100 hertz. It was fast for us. Um, but it was always it was built for actors, right? This was this was the days when the motion capture companies just realized that robotics was actually a pretty good application because they had always just been doing it for uh, tracking people, and there was just this this setting in their code that was uh, wait 50 seconds before 50 milliseconds before sending so that people can look over there and then look at the screen. <laughs> so we like fought like crazy to get them to turn that off, and then things got better. But it was still not optimized for for delay. Um, we were fighting that. Uh, okay, so in the end, you know, this was the, these were the numbers. We got to like a 1.1 with that little flat plate glider. Pretty good. Um, yeah, there's some cool stunt maneuvers that are that are out there too with human pilots that were pretty good that are close. Um, feedback is essential. So if it was open loop, so the perch was right there, it missed the perch every single time. 
So the way we did this was we took that model, we did trajectory optimization to find a, a perch, and I, I guess I, my slides are out of order, and then we did TV LQR to stabilize it, and it went from that open loop missing every time to uh, landing on the perch every time, mostly, from, from a small range of initial, that was from the crossbow. Um, so, so relatively controlled initial conditions, we could land on the perch every time. You have a crossbow in your lab? It's a piece of 8020 with a big rubber band, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, to make it more robust, what we did was, and this is the beginning, you know, this is, this is most of the story for the, the trees, was we, we actually went through and computed the regions of attraction for those controllers. This was a finite horizon analysis of the LQR controller, asking it to land, the level set we cared about was something that land where the perch, where the grasping mechanism was sufficiently close to the perch. And that gives us this sort of, in this one, just a cartoon funnel because the real thing lives in high dimensional space. Okay, so we said if we started inside that initial condition, we had some sort of sense that our controller was good enough we'd get to the perch. So we could, you know, at that point in the research, we'd fire it off the cannon if it got stuck or whatever. We, we, could, we could tell as it left the launcher whether it was gonna succeed or not. That was a bad launch, you know, whatever. And we could, you know, we got to the point where we were modeling that pretty well. Um, and then to get to the point where Joe could throw it from any initial condition and it always landed on the perch, we needed something more. And this is now where the trees part comes in. Um, we designed a, new, a library of trajectories where each initial condition we cared about, we'd do some trajectory. It didn't have to go all the way to the goal, but it had to go back to some trajectory we knew how to get to the goal from. And then we added a new LQR controller, which found itself into, that, into the LQR controller of the existing one. We computed its region of attraction, its funnel, and we added that. And then, you know, this was, this is still sort of my best, um, uh, my best answer for how do you think about the relevant part of state space in high dimensions is you pick a handful of trajectories and you think about them regionally using the best tools you can, you know, for all X up to some scale. And you fill that out. Now there's ways to make that provably fill up the entire controllable space and we'll talk about that when, we've, when it snaps together with the motion planning, but that's the basic idea. This is the project that changed my mind about linear control. I used to, I started off saying, you know, uh, we're doing nonlinear things, linear controls are irrelevant, you guys are, you know, you guys are old school, we're, the new school is coming in. Uh, and then I realized that uh, linear control works ridiculously well for this system. Okay, so uh, the, the funnel of that, you know, nominal trajectory, if it came off the launcher too slow, it would actually gain altitude and then dip down and go. If it was too fast, it would actually bleed off energy and come. It would take surprisingly large deviations from the nominal trajectory in order to accomplish the task. In a way that, that really, that picture of me saying the linearization looks pretty good on the nonlinear vector field, that, I believe that, you know, mostly because I started believing that in this project. Um, you know, and that's at the, trajectories look like in the model. Uh, <clears throat> the interesting thing is that you can look at the, this is where we did have to do the square root method to integrate this back, because this thing's just barely controllable. So S would try to go negative, def, you know, negative all the time. We had to use square root methods and the like. And you could sort of analyze the controllability, and maybe not surprisingly, along that nominal trajectory, you have relatively a lot of control authority at the beginning, but as your velocity goes to zero, since your only control surfaces are velocity dependent airfoils, your control authority also goes to zero as you get close to the perch, which is kind of a bummer if the wind blows at the end or whatever, it doesn't work so well. So as we were trying to transition to outdoors, we actually had a whole project where we built a power line and used the magnetic field and, and the magne magnetometers on the plane to localize the perch relative to the thing. It was kind of fun. Um, but. We started building flapping airplanes because it gives you control authority at the end, right? As your airspeed was going to zero, our control authority was going to zero, so well, maybe there's a reason to flap. Um, so maybe at least two reasons why flapping is good for perching. First of all, it actually slows you down pretty well. And second of all, you can main air airspeed on the wings for your control authority. 
and we actually built it. This is our flapping glider that could land on a perch. Yep. And that's basically just trajectory optimization and TVLQR, plus a lot of modeling work and a bunch of broken planes. <laughs> right? Okay, cool. Uh, we'll see you next Tuesday. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so for the flapping one, the LQR dimensionality is significantly larger than the flash, right? Yeah. So much harder to solve. LQR scales. Oh, okay. Good, see you then.